Welcome everyone to the Ask an Architect show. Excited to be here today with John Pendorf uh, from Perkins and Will. Um, so we're gonna go into his career as an architect and a little bit about his background professionally and try to give you guys some insights into uh, what it's like out there in the profession. Uh, before we get started, I wanna say thank you to our sponsor, the AIA, the American Institute of Architects. Uh, they're a huge supporter of this program and we couldn't do it without them, so thank you, AIA. Uh, with that said, John, let's get into it. Why don't you give me the uh, brief 77 se second background, who you are and why you matter. Okay, um, so I'm an architect. I'm licensed in DC and Virginia okay. and um, I've been an architect now, a licensed architect for over 10 years. Um, I grew up in New Rochelle, New York, which is a suburb just outside of New York City. Okay. And um, came down to Washington, D.C. for school, stayed because I liked the city so much, and uh, been here ever since. I live on Capitol Hill in D.C. Cool. with my family, two kids, my wife, and two cats. Very cool. Um, let's, you, you mentioned coming down from New York to Catholic, so let's start there. Um, after you were here at Catholic, why did you stick around? What was so attractive about D.C. for you to start your professional career here? Well, uh, a few reasons. One is uh, it was four hours away by train from home, so it was easy enough easy. to get home when I needed to, but far enough away that there was a good sure. buffer. Um, <laughs> but also, D.C. captivated me just because it's constantly changing. There's uh, both for the political climate, but also for the architecture. We've got a lot of different styles of architecture here. You can practice in a lot of different methods. Um, I also got a really great job, uh, which was an opportunity because I ended up uh, working for the first six years of my professional life on what was my thesis project in grad school. Oh, very cool. So that's a personal interest that you were able to continue yes. on, and so that makes a lot of sense. Um, so when you came down here, um, you started to kind of, you worked for several firms along the way, mm -hmm. and I'd be remiss if I didn't say congratulations, uh, a recent fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Thanks. Um, so uh, along your path to that F, you've, you've had some stepping stones along the way. Absolutely. And I wanted to kind of go through them real quick, and if you could, just in little snippets for our audience, um, kind of give a sentence or two about what you learned most from these experiences. What, what was your big takeaway? Okay. Um, so let's start at the beginning, which I think, is it, is it Chatelaine Architects? Chatelaine Architects. Chatelaine Architects. So I was there for seven years, and that's seven where years. I got my okay. license. Um, I think the biggest two takeaways from there is don't be afraid to dive right in. It was a small firm, so I got to do a lot of different things fairly quickly in terms of project work, project management, client mm -hmm. interaction, but also the value of strong mentors. Um, I had both my IDP mentor was one of the folks who was at the firm, but also uh, the owner of the firm, who was a third generation architect, is a third generation architect, um, uh, were fantastic mentors in terms of allowing me to explore my own interests as well as contributing to, to projects. Very good. So next up, uh, is it Dorsky Hot Hodgson Parish U? Yes, D-H-P-Y. D-H-P-Y. Um, so I felt like I needed to, to uh, do something different after seven years and see what else is out there. So I did uh, make the move to D-H-P-Y and it was completely different types of project work. So I got exposure to um, uh, markets that I, I hadn't worked in before and I think that was important for me because um, I was still pretty early in my career mm -hmm. and I wanted to make sure that I was doing what exactly what I wanted to do and, and wasn't overlooking something. We've had people say that on this show before that um, obviously two different perspectives, stay at one place forever or hop around and the people that hop around a little bit say that it's really good to figure out what building types you like, what type of building, or what building types you're good at, and if it's going to be your entire career, you should have an interest and a passion for mm -hmm. it. So, how do you how do you find that passion until you've you you know gone out and sampled them? You know, I think um, it's hard to understand what your passion is if you're if you know you're not passionate about something else. Mm -hmm. So, um, especially early in your career, if you find a place like I did where I was there for seven years. Uh, to stick with what was nice about Chatelaine Architects is that we didn't just do one type of project We did a few different types, so it gave me a pretty good range, but it didn't complete the range It also solidified my interest in sustainability, but it didn't um, I wasn't sure if there were other aspects to sustainability because of other project types that I wasn't really touching on It was a hard decision to leave after sure. seven years. But yeah, seven years feels like that <laughs> You're kind of at the point where you're almost, you know Are you gonna be there for the long term right. or, or right. yeah? 
Um, all right, so let's move on. You had Chatelaine Architects, you had uh, DHPY. Uh, tell me about the Lassard Group. So, sometimes when you make a change, it's not because you wanted to. Uh, so, sure. I was let go from DHPY during the economic downturn of 2008, 2009, as were so many architects. Okay. Um, I was only out of work for about two and a half months before I found the position at Lassard Group. Okay. And it wasn't a perfect match for me, but um, it allowed me to use some of the skills I had developed at DHPY in terms of project types. Um, it also, I, I have to say, and I know it, they're our sponsor, but um, shout out to the AIA because if I didn't have the, um, the involvement in AIA back then um, as an emerging professional, I don't think I would have been as marketable and gotten picked up so quickly even in the economic downturn. Because by that time I'd already gotten my license, I was showing leadership skills with the local chapter of AIA, um, and I was starting to show interest in uh, national involvement. So I think that was really appealing to um, my boss at the time, who, who I ended up working for. That, that's a good point to pause in, in your trajectory because you do have a lot of service with the AIA and, and professionally. Um, we could frankly do an entire you know uh, video about that experience and, and what you bring to the table from, from all those perspectives. Um, but it sounds like not only was that good for you personally and you know to give back to the profession, but also it helps with connections and networking Absolutely. and things like that. And so yep. you actually saw it. Trans translate into a job in this case. Yeah, I was able to, I mean, reach out directly to um, other board members on the DC chapter uh, board, uh, the staff at, at AIADC, let them know that I was looking. And um, while that didn't directly re result in this job, it was um, it was good to have sort of the irons in the fire and people speaking on your behalf and knowing that mm -hmm. you're dependable, reliable. So that your name is out there yeah, being passed absolutely. around. Going back to the kind of the old adage of it's, it's who you know, not what you know. Sometimes it definitely is, especially in a downturn. Yep. When the jobs aren't plentiful. It's a great point. And look, everything's cyclical. The last downturn was, you know, 08, 09, mm -hmm. and that's that's now eight or nine years removed. Yeah. So We're um, very close to what people think might yeah. be another one, but you know, I think architecture in general right now is a lot stronger than it was in 2008. We learned a lot from that downturn in terms of practice. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go back to the Lassard Group. Sure. What's your, what, what was your big takeaway from that experience professionally? So my big takeaway was probably uh, know when to say no. Know when to, to realize you're not in the place that is the perfect fit for you. Um, it was a good experience. It was a learning experience for me. I got to know some great people. Um, my boss at Lassard Group is now my boss at Perkins and Will. Oh, interesting. Um, so it's funny how things kind of come back mm -hmm. to haunt you, um, in a good way, of course. But, uh, but it wasn't the right fit for me. So it wasn't the right fit uh, in terms of project work, in terms of where I saw my, my potential trajectory going for, for professional development. So I think it, that's, you bring up an interesting point about how important it is to be self-aware about you know, your own personal growth and what you're good at, what you like, what you don't like, and where you can excel, and maybe where you can't. Right. Be honest with yourself so that you can set yourself up for the next, Absolutely. next step. Yeah. Um, okay, from Lassard Group, we go to Bowie Gridley Architects. Bowie Gridley, so that was more in my wheelhouse. It was okay. back in D.C., and uh, it was doing a lot of education work, which I was really passionate about. Um, it also allowed me to explore some additional aspects of sustainability, which I thought was, was really great. Um, and it was a great working environment. Uh, the people there are um, very warm and friendly and easy to get along with, and um, it, was a, it was sort of a step back to me in the direction of where I wanted my path to go in terms of sure. the type of work I was doing. Great. Um, and then finally, where you are now, Perkins and Will. Right. And this was a job that I wasn't looking for. So again, it's about who you know mm -hmm. and the connections you make and not burning bridges and all those fun yep. lessons learned from your past. But um, my, my, my boss came to me and said, hey, we've got this position for a sustainability leader and project manager, I know this is the type of work you want to do. Is it, I know you're not looking, but can we talk? And it took a while for me to say yes, because it's a big firm. I had never worked for a big firm before, but um, but it's turned out to be an absolutely amazing experience for me. Cool. And John, I just want to thank you for going through those, because 
especially for our audience, um, you know, we want to give them as much value as possible in a short amount of time. And um, you know, a lot of folks are out at schools that are in more rural areas, maybe not closely connected to cities. So to get a, s a snapshot of what it's like in so many different firms so quickly, I think is uh, brings a lot of value. So thank you for, for sure. going through that. Um, so let's talk about where you are now and what you're doing and, and your passions there. Okay. Um, so you mentioned your role is sustainability leader. Um, what, what does that mean? What is a sustainability leader at Perkins & Will? So in the office, I do a lot of uh, internal consulting on our projects, sort of uh, being brought in to help um, set priorities for sustainability. Um, what is maybe sometimes just lead versus going beyond lead to more uh, talking about net zero, energy waste, et cetera. Um, but I also work sort of at the firm-wide level. I sit on the resilience task force, so helping to push forward resilience education, climate adaptation planning, things like that, firm-wide. So, so it's more strategic at the at the firm-wide level, high level, than necessarily just um, you know tactical within every single project. It's I would say it's about fifty-fifty okay. because I'm, there are definitely days where I'm doing lead documentation for a okay. project, and sometimes it's my project, and sometimes it's someone else's. Sure. Um, and then there are days where I'm on a firm-wide call talking about how can we bring in uh, outside resources to enhance our climate adaptation research. Okay. So it's it's kind of fun, and it's the way my I've learned my brain works too. It's like I like having lots of different projects going at the same time as opposed to focused on the one variety. big project. The variety is really helpful to me. Good. Um, uh, piggybacking on that a little bit, I read something about the Sustainable Design Initiative at mm -hmm. Perkins and Will. Is that something that's still ongoing? And, and if so, can you, can you talk about it? It's all? kind of morphed. Um, okay. So it used to be this firm-wide committee that okay. was really just focused on general sustainability. About three years ago, we um, I don't want to say disintegrated it, but we, we focused it into six different subject areas. Okay. So people could really focus on their passions. So resilience, um, material health, um, net zero energy or net positive energy, benchmarking, water, um, and sustainable communities. So we've people are actually now able to focus their research there. It's not just about the project work, it's about how are we making a better place to practice as a whole by giving people resources when a client comes to you and says, hey, I want to do this, that we can actually potentially provide those services in-house. So by creating these concentrations, it's almost like you provide a platform to become a thought leader in that, and then in yeah. that, and in that, and then I assume you amass all of these expertises together, and you can provide that to the client. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all about can we provide all these in a project, but also are we pushing out our our own folks as thought leaders. So you can actually go to our website and we have a, a, a sub-site on our website called the Research Labs and you can actually um, click on resilience for example and see exactly like who's writing what research papers, how it's being applied to projects. Um, I think there's even a place where you can ask an expert where you can post a question. So we're trying to also make it um, a more outward facing experience for all of our staff to be able to get involved in. Yeah, I imagine that's very attractive for staff to be able to have that these opportunities to, to dive into their own personal passions, whatever it might Absolutely, be. Absolutely, because there are times where maybe your individual project isn't focused on your individual passion, but it allows you this separate um, outlet to really um, feel fulfilled in your, pro in your yeah. professional work because it's all about what you do over your 40 hours a week, not just mm -hmm. maybe what that you're doing that day or that hour. Um, so, John, a lot of firms um, and architects are, are focusing on sustainability now. It's almost becoming integrated into just good mm -hmm. design, right? Absolutely. Um, but what makes uh, we talked? Maybe maybe it was the it was the concentrations we just spoke about. But what makes it so special at Perkins and Will? Because there's obviously a little bit of a, a reputation as a thought leader in sustainability at Perkins and Will. So, is there anything else about the firm itself that makes it so special in that in that area? Well, there's definitely a culture of innovation, um, and it's innovation at all levels. It doesn't mean you have to be a principal or even an associate principal. Um, we've got a program called the Innovation Incubator, which are micro-grants that anyone in the firm can apply for, and if it's accepted, you get 40 paid hours to do a piece of research and a small stipend to cover costs. And at the end, um, it's either a white paper or a video, and you're required to present it back to your office. And then it comes into this sort of repository of, of data, some of which is project specific and some of which is literally just being able to research a passion. So I think harnessing that, we have a, 
we have a Perkins and Will Research Journal once a year that's a, a peer-reviewed research journal where okay. you can actually put research papers into. Um, and then just putting our thought leadership out there. So in addition to the labs, we've got something called the Transparency website, which we've had for about six years now. Is that transparency in materials? It is. Okay. So it's, um, it's an aggregation of third-party um, research about known substances that cause specific health hazards and uh, it offers people uh, the ability to find options. So I don't want to put this material in my project. What are the options to replace that in my specs? And it's available to the public. Anybody can see that. So I think to me that's one of the some of the things that really align with my values because I, I think you know we're trying to make society better as a whole, not just for Perkins and Will's projects, but for all architecture practice. So what happens if a client comes in that doesn't align with your values? What if a client comes in and they're uh, worried mostly purely about the bottom line and getting it done, but they know Perkins and Will has a great reputation and they want a Perkins and Will project? So what um, do you do? It's tough, and sometimes it's a it's a long conversation to, f to try to figure out what's really the motivating factors for your client. Um, certainly, you can talk a lot about sustainability, energy efficiency. All of those have direct relations to the bottom line. So sometimes it's about just speaking the same language as your client and saying, you know, we're not just doing this because it's the right thing to do. It's also going to save you money. You know, there's a great return on investment, or um, you know, it's going to make the people in your building healthier, which in turn, if you follow the little chain of, of events, drives down your health insurance costs and drives down absenteeism and things like that. So sometimes it's just speaking the same language as your client and understanding that you're really all going towards the same goals. So if you can get a clear picture early on as to what their key performance indicators are, you can almost flip the script in a way and say, well, if that's what's really important to you, let me show you how right. sustainable design can help you achieve that. Yeah, saving money in bottom line doesn't always have to mean just value engineering and sure. cutting things out of the project. It may mean looking at the project over the long haul and saying, yeah, those lights are going to cost you, you know, three times more now because they're LED, but over the life of the building, you're actually going to save 12 times the cost of the light. Mm -hmm. So, you so know, it's making those those points along the and way. And being able to present that information in a way that the client really understands. Sure. Um, so John, let's let's pop out of the the day to day um, uh, technical aspects for a second. Let's talk about you personally and how that affects you professionally. So you mentioned earlier you have a family, Capitol Hill, a couple kids. So what do you learn? What have you learned from your kids? You have a couple young kids, right? Yes. Yeah. Nine um, and four. Nine and four. <laughs> what have you learned from your kids that um, helps you become a better architect? What do you see on a, you know, from time to time? Um, patience um, is one big thing, and in, in learning that as they're learning things and exploring things, not to rush them. It's the same as you know when I'm working with someone who is new to the firm. You know, give them time to explore. Give them time to understand. I will say, and something that I have told people before, um, some of the greatest lessons that have come through my children have been reading children's books with them. Um, if you're ever feeling dejected as an architect or uh, stuck in a rut, go read Rosie Revere Engineer. Go read Iggy Peck Architect. Because the messages in there about not giving up when you fail, um, Sometimes I, I'm, I'm reading it to them and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what I was doing today. You know, like it's, yeah. it's directly applicable to an adult just as much as it is to a kid. Um, the, the Disney movie, Meet the Robinsons, you know, that move that the, the end result of ne uh, keep moving forward. You know, don't get, don't get distraught because you failed the first time. It's the best fail ever when you fail the first time. That's good. So read, read children's books as well as uh, your, your structure movies. books. <laughs> your structure textbooks. Um, all right, John, one thing to wrap it up, we'll keep it on the, the personal level as well. Sure. You mentioned that one of your passions or your interests is, is mixology. Yes. So give us a drink recommendation. What is a John <laughs> Pendorf original that for those of us who are of age can go out and sample oh, gosh. this weekend? An, uh, um, an original. Whatever strikes you, you tell me. So, what do you really want to recommend to our audience? Um, I, I I tend toward uh, bourbon and gin. Bourbon Not and together, gin. but separate. <laughs> um, so uh, one of my favorites at home, which is really easy to make, is um, bourbon, like one part, one and a half parts bourbon, to two parts tonic water, to one part cranberry juice, and a squeeze of lime over ice. Excellent. Does that drink have a name? Not particularly. It's something that I picked up from a friend and uh, and maybe tweaked the recipe just a little bit. But it's 
it's refreshing, it's uh, not particularly overly alcoholic, um, and uh, it looks pretty in the glass, too. So. Always important. <laughs> well, thanks so much, John. Yeah, I appreciate absolutely. you being on the show. Uh, we've gone through a lot of different things. We've gone through sustainability. We've talked a lot about Perkins and Will. We went through a whole variety of firms. We taught kids, children's books, and mixology with John Pendorf. So thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Ask an Architect show.